Now, before we move on, we decided to do something slightly different this time. I've got one waiting for uh, admission. If we admit that so that I can launch something. Now, we've decided that one, one way of testing uh, you guys in um, your understanding of the topic is we've decided to include questions that can come in part one of the exam. And shortly, you will see in front of you a poll with three questions. We will uh, wait for you to answer these questions. Here you go. So, as you can see, there are some questions in front of you. I would like each one, please, to try and answer these questions. We will give you a couple of minutes. Can you all see it? Please, mentors, can you see it? Yes, good. So, please, candidates, uh, answer this if you can. And uh, I can see that no one has voted. Can you see it all, guys, please? We can see it, uh, Abdullah, but um, not sure how we can choose the answer. So that's because we're co-hosts, so we don't. Ah, okay, fine. Sorry. Um, the every all all participants, uh, please answer the questions because the quicker we answer those questions, we can... Amjad, can I can I use you as a guinea pig, please? Would you be kind enough to see whether you can answer any of these questions? I I can't. I, I cannot submit it. I can answer the question. But, um, Just answer it, see what happens. Click on end, something. End polling yeah, it it yeah? doesn't allow me to submit. End polling at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's start again. So relaunch. Uh, continue, continue. Let's see again. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Can you answer uh, it? I answer it, but... It, you know there is a submit uh, uh, icon there down at the bottom? Yes. Just, just scroll down, answer all the questions and just leave it. Oh, answer all the questions? Yes. Yeah. I have to, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I have to answer all the questions. I thought that is just one, one question. No, no. Okay, that's interesting. No one else is answering questions? Ah, uh, here you go. So people are answering now. I've got two people answering. Okay. So guys, please answer it. I will wait for uh, something like 80% of, uh, of people answering. Yeah. And once we get that, we will stop it. And then we will retest you guys at the end of it to see whether that presentation made any difference. I will end the polling now. We've got 76% voted. I am not going to share the result. Okay. Especially mine. Okay, now, back to the topic. Well, I don't know which one is yours because it doesn't show me any names. It just shows the percentage. Let's move on. So, since we made, we, back to the topic, let's start about how, how the clot forms. The clot is a combination of two factors, the cell factors and the protein factors or the, the chemicals. In this both of them need a triad which is called the virtuous triad which i know all of you know there are three important aspects number one is to increase coagulation of the blood and this can be because of conditions like cancer thrombophilia which is like a congenital conditions inflammatory disease the second factor is stasis of blood slowing of the flow of the blood which make it more prone to clotting and this happens with immobilization, varicose veins, any obstruction localized or uh, even for, because of a tumor. The third factor is a vessel wall injury that exposes the proteins, the collagens of the vessel wall to the blood flow. And that starts a cascade of events, starting from the uh, uh, platelets being attracted to that collagen to try and block that area and that the, uh, it's releasing chemicals that would activate the uh, um, coagulation process, a cascade, leading in a formation of a clot. That the, the vessel wall injury can be because of surgery, chemical irritation, inflammation, or infection. The importance of this triad is this is what we actually screen for because before the operation. Any operation, you check for these. Okay. The next. Again, this is an important slide. 
this is a busy, busy slide, and I'm not going to attempt to explain every bit of it. Unfortunately, it will be beyond any presentation to talk it. However, I am putting you a link to videos in YouTube in the next slide, which explain it in a very nice way. Please spend some time, each video takes something like four minutes, five minutes. Please spend some time reading it. In addition, it is explained well in the books like uh, Ramachandran or Banaskovich. What I will say, which is trying to brief that, is basically we have two pathways. We have the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic path pathway. One of them, which is the intrinsic, you check with the APTT. The extrinsic, you check with the PT and INR. The, the uh, chain of events starts with factor 12, which can be activated by the exposure to collagen to 12A, and that leads to factor 11 activation, and then factor 9 activation, and then in the presence of factor 8, activation of factor 10, which is the important uh, common uh, factor. The same, th well, similarly in the intrinsic, uh, sorry, in the in extrinsic pathway, a trauma leads to activation of factor 7, which activates factor 10 to 10A. Now, 10A is an important factor. Once the activation happens, it activates prothrombin 2 to thrombin, and then activates fibrinogen to the fibrin, which is the protein that mainly presents in the clot. Then this gets degraded in the presence of plasminogen, which again gets activated into plasmin, and then it degrades the clot. The degradation products of the fibrin is what we check through the D-dimer. So the D-dimer actually is the degradation of the fibrin. As you can see here, there are important other factors. We've mentioned factor eight, we've mentioned the calcium. We, if you look at the left-hand side, you will see active protein C, which inhibits factor eight and factor five A. So the presence of that protein stops the clotting and the lack of protein C allows the clotting to go slightly uncontrolled. Okay, now this, uh, these I found useful tutorials on YouTube. Um, uh, I don't want to waste your time by launching these videos. Please look for handwritten tutorials in, uh, about hemostasis in YouTube. It's really nice. And it is made in a way that allows you to practice drawing the cascade, which is a very important and um, a very common question in the exam to draw the clotting cascade. Please, please, please practice drawing it while talking and lining up or labeling well, where each medication work. Okay. It is important for you to understand the medications you use and the common way of asking the question in the exam, I I can't remember last time they said, tell me about warfarin. They don't normally start it like this. Usually what they do is they will ask you a do proficient and then you suggest a medication and then they ask you, how does that work and how, what is the dose, you know, the practicalities of it. And the reason is you are a con being a consultant. You can choose whatever medication you want to choose, but you have to justify it. However, the common medications used are warfarin, heparin, factor 10A inhibitors, direct thrombin inhibitors, and aspirin and clopidogrel. If you look here on the right hand side, it is a simplified diagram, and I have highlighted where the warfarin work. Basically, it works by stopping the uh, vitamin K dependent uh, anticoagulants, which are factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Because it stops production of them in the liver, it takes three, two to three days to start working and it needs to be built up as the body consumes or uh, uh, degrades the older uh, factors that do exist and have been pro uh, produced in the past. Once it starts working, it has a long life and it takes uh, five days uh, at least for the INR to come back to normal. Again, as you mentioned, as you noticed, we check it with INR levels. Uh, it can be re reversed by two things, either, as you know, give vitamin K or by reverse it acutely with fresh frozen plasma to replace all the clotting factors. 
there is an important thing that not many orthopedic surgeons know, and it comes from the hematologist. If the patient is started on warfarin, they go through a phase of hypercoagulopathy, hypercoagulation for about a day or two. And they always recommend using low molecular weight heparin or heparin during that period to stop the patient getting a clot. So when you start warfarin during the first two days, there will be a risk of actually the patient getting a clot. The next medication is heparin. And again, I've highlighted where it works. It basically works in two factors, factors 10 and factor two. It forms a, a, a combination, a compound with um, antithrombin three, which stops the thrombin. Uh, it is usually a, a protein that is produced naturally and has high uh, molecular weight of 5,000 to 15,000 Daltons. The low molecular weight heparins are the ones that are less than 8,000 Daltons and they work only on factor 10A and they are given subcutaneously. If a bleeding uh, happens, then uh, we could stop it by protamine sulfate, which is the antidote. And again, you can give uh, fresh frozen plasma in acute phases. Um, other side effects for long-term use is osteoporosis, allergic reaction, and thrombocytopenia. Uh, the DOACs are the uh, oral medications, which are new medications, and they are divided into factor 10A inhibitors and antithrombin inhibitors. The factor 10A inhibitors are apixaban, idoxaban, and rivaroxaban, taken orally, um, and there is no need to monitor them. There is a remark. Uh, whenever the patient is on apixaban, idoxaban, or rivaroxaban, INR, APTT, or PT do not have a value in checking whether they are working or not. And there is a paper written saying uh, specifically, please do not be fooled by normal INR into thinking that the fact the apixaban is not working. It could be working with normal uh, uh, measurements. And the only way of knowing is time, because they have a predictable elimination time, which is uh, 36 to 48 hours. And please check the local guidelines, because a hematologist would have produced that, to tell you when it is safe to do elective procedures or um, uh, acute procedures. Similarly, the uh, direct thrombin inhibitors like dabigatran, they are exactly the same. However, the long, the, uh, li long life, they have a longer uh, half-life. Aspirin is the oldest, uh, well, one of the oldest anticoagulations, and it works by uh, stopping the thrombexane A2 working, um, and they, they stop the aggregation of the platelets. It is effective in the prevention of DVT and, P and PE, and now NICE has recognized it again, the importance of it. Now, people who work in Scotland know that SIGN, which is the equivalent of NICE in Scotland, has long been advocating its use even uh, from, uh, I remember, from, from the uh, early 2000s. Um, it, it is safe to operate even with the aspirin in present. However, it has to be discussed with the anesthetist. It is better if we wait for a day or two. Clopidogrel, however, irreversibly blocks the aggregation of the uh, platelets. And then, hence, we have to wait for new uh, cohort of platelets to be produced. Hence, we have to wait for five days. We'll talk about non-pharmacological prophylaxis, and I will be talking about mobility, foot and calf pumps, TED stockings, and IVC filters. The most important factor in stopping the clot forming is the natural way, which is mobility. And the mobility works by using the calf muscles as natural pumps to push the blood through the uh, valves in the veins of the lower limbs, as demonstrated here. And that's why it is very important to encourage the patient to start mobilizing as early as, the, uh, as possible after the operation. And again, that's why NICE has recognized it as an important milestone in the patient journey. So a lot of their guidelines state once the patient starts mobilizing, we can reduce the uh, prophylaxis of anticoagulation. Next is foot calf pumps, as demonstrated with that picture. It tries to mimic the effect of the calf muscles, and it's more important when the patient are, is in bed for pain relief or because of the use of block, or more importantly, when the patient is in the operation. Uh, in addition, they can, um, they have to, we have to uh, exercise caution using them in, if there is an already uh, peripheral vascular disease, fragile skin, or anything that would stop us uh, putting it on the skin or 
the shape of the leg, for example, makes it awkward or applying pressure uneven on the whole leg. Moving to the Tate stockings, they have got a gradual compression along the, the way. There is evidence that the combination of both at the same time, which I have seen some hospital use, where they put the TED stocking and then they put the cuff pump on top, is actually detrimental because it, um, it reduces the efficacy of the pump. IVC filter is not something you would be expected to request, but if there is a frequent uh, um, DVT and clotting and the patient is high risk, Sometimes they can mention that it is already on there or you can mention it as a suggestion and the way they work They have different shapes the way they work is they are inserted in the inferior vena cava and they hopefully Capture the big clots. They don't capture the small clots. They have to capture on the big clots There is a debate about how effective they are and whether they actually can cause clots themselves Hence don't don't suggest it. But if it's been mentioned just mention that this is how they work they can be temporary, sometimes for patient, patients who have cancer and they are going through a big operation, they can be up, uh, inserted and then removed after the operation. Another med uh, medications they, med they would mention are tranexamic acid and the way tranexamic wo acid works is by stabilizing the clot by stopping the activation of uh, plasminogen to plasmin. Uh, they, it can be used in elective surgery and there is, there is more and more evidence coming that it is safe and, and very good actually for knee replacement, for example, where it reduces the need for uh, blood transfusion. Um, and there is a crash a trial which mentions its use in the uh, trauma. Fresh frozen plasma replaces quickly the uh, consumed clottings uh, factors and platelets can be given again to enhance the patient's ability to clot. Let's talk about some common conditions that we may encounter and the, again the question comes in the exam that this patient has this condition what do you think as part of their workup so all these increases the chance of patients getting a clot the first four conditions are congenital they will just say this patient has a protein c deficiency or whatever and i've highlighted how it works in that diagram all what you need to say is they've had they've got a high risk of, of uh, DVT and I will be discussing them with the hematology and reverse uh, sorry uh, discuss uh, according to the uh, local hospital protocol there is a con acquired condition which is antiphospholipid syndrome which is an autoimmune and acquired condition that again can lead to uh, hyper uh, coagulation let's talk about DVT now DVT, I mean, I'm going to talk briefly, you all know about this. It's a, condi a condition where a clot forms in the deep veins of the leg. Uh, the incidence in one in a thousand increases by uh, risk factors like congenital as virtual trials. So if they ask you about the risk factors, it is virtual trials, uh, triad. The presentation is uh, after an incident of immobility on operation, cancer, any pressure, and then patient comes with pain in the leg with swelling and edema. The investigation is by venography, venous duplex, and D-dimer. And uh, the gold standard is the venous duplex scan. The treatment is uh, assessment for prevention, and then you talk about anticoagulation and rarely IVC filter. And as I mentioned, don't suggest it. Just be aware of it. And if they say that everything fails, you say, I'm aware of it, da -di da the complications, the, the risk of DVT is not DVT itself because most of these clots dissolve themselves. However, it can lead to PE, which I will be talking about in a second. But they can lead to chronic venous insufficiency, leaving the patient with chronic swollen pitting edema in the leg with uh, skin changes and high uh, uh, pressure in the veins of the leg itself and can lead to recurrence of the DVT itself. Thromboembolism is the traveling of the clots from the deep veins of the leg all the way to the uh, uh, arteries of the uh, lung. It leads to sudden shortness of breath with pleuritic pain, tachypnea and tachycardia. It can vary depending on the size of the clot from mild shortness of breath or even asymptomatic to death. The assessment, again, the question in the exam comes, a patient comes five days, six days, whatever after, complaining of these symptoms and they want to, for you to say I will go and see the patient take a history assess the patient and the tests I will be asking for would be an ECG ABG chest x-ray and the gold standard is CTPA 
And as you can see here, the uh, I will uh, draw your attention to these marks. You can see the uh, darker shadow representing the clots in these areas there. And the treatment, I will be discussing him with the chest physicians. However, the treatment principles are coagulation, thromboprophylaxis, uh, and sometimes they will need HDU bed for uh, oxygen support. And I will warn that the patient has a high risk of recurrence. Fat embolism is not part of the uh, a technical thromboembolism as such, but it is in a, a condition that we have to differentiate between the two. The reason is it, it can happen again after operation, but usually it happens in the early days rather than uh, later days like a DVT PE. As you can see, it causes petechiae in the skin with hemorrhage to the brain. However, we might give a talk about this in more details later. Now, the, this is an important slide because in the exam, this is a typical answer about how you would uh, assess the patient for DVT. The, the question can come like, how would you prevent DVT from happening? Or how would you devise a hospital protocol for DVT prophylaxis? Or how would you screen for DVT? These all come and leading to the same answer. And the answer have to be divided into these headlines. The first one is pre-op, intra-op, and post-op. And a pre-op, I've highlighted separately screening and stratifying. So, which is exactly as NICE guidelines say. You screen patients and you stratify their risk factors. And then pre-operatively, you make sure that they are hydrated, they are aware, they are stratified and you discuss their intraoperative management, which can include mechanical prophylaxis, and postoperative operatively, you encourage early mobilization, mechanical and chemical prophylaxis, and early assessment of patients presenting with uh, worrying symptoms. And then you talk about chemical and non-pharmacological factors, and then you have to mention the local guidelines derived from the NICE guidelines. So this is, again, how you phrase your answer. Moving on to the next slide, which is NICE guidelines. Again, as I mentioned to you, this has been changed in March 2018. And the important things that uh, have been highlighted are the coming back of aspirin and the stressing of the uh, mobility as a factor for prevention. And in brief, I will summarize that. There is a small summary of it. You can download that from the uh, internet and I will put in the Telegram group a small summary of all the NICE guidelines in a way that uh, is, is practical. However, it's, represent, it's, it's the same as these slides. So for any immobilization, stratify the patient. You have to start low molecular weight heparin uh, for uh, if the out of the VTE risk out, for, out uh, is higher than the risk of bleeding and keep that until the patient start mobilizing or up until 42 days. Similar thing for hip fractures, pelvic fracture. However, they say that pneumatic compression is uh, reasonable if the oral prophylaxis is contraindicated, oh, sorry, if chemical prophylaxis is contraindicated. Elective total hip replacement, the new thing they have divided into three lines. So the first line is low molecular weight followed by aspirin or mechanical at 10 days. Or the second line, apixaban, dabigatran or uh, stockings. Teototal knee replacement, the new thing which is very important you have to be aware of is they have started to consider aspirin from day one. And it's only for two weeks or you can use low molecular weight heparin. However, people continue to use apixaban and dabigatran. All knee operations that are short with no risk, then you don't need to do anything. Otherwise, you give low molecular weight until mobility or 14 or 20 days, sorry, uh, 14 days. Or again, the same thing for foot and ankle. Upper limb surgery, again, if there is no risk factors and the operation is short, no need. Again, if there is, you give something for a short period of time. Spine surgery, because of the risk of bleeding into the spine is important. So they advocate using only mechanical prophylaxis. However, if there is a high risk, you can use low molecular weight heparin, but after, you, you, that after a reasonable time where a clot would have formed to stop the bleeding into the spine. In major trauma, the importance of mechanical prophylaxis is very is stressed again. And that's it. 
No, it's, it's something. Uh, I think for, for spine surgery, you need to be careful. Um, yes, yes. It's usually local guidelines. As Abdullah was saying, yes, we, we tend to use mechanical prophylaxis more than uh, everything else. But you can use the, usually in our local uh, guidelines, we use uh, enoxaparin, uh, which is low molecular weight heparin. But you use it after to 24 hours after the operation in a small operation. Or in a big operation, you can use it after 48 hours. Or if the drains is used, you can use it 24 hours after the drains is out. Okay, so this is our local guidelines here in our... Uh, okay, MTCs. thank you, Amjad. I, I didn't know that. Slide that you go to screening, number one, when you go to screening, so every patient in the hospital has to be screened for risk of DVT. This mm -hmm. is the most important information. You need to make sure all patients all patients coming to the hospital, they need to be assessed, screened for risk of DVT. And then it doesn't matter what, guide, what uh, protocol you are using, the majority of all the, all the patients, they have to have risk assessment for DVT. Uh, fresh frozen plasma versus octoplast. Um, any thoughts? I should say, we should say, we should say, um, I would give, um, um, vitamin K IV and, and our our uh, expertise stops here and then we'll call the hematologist and ask for advice if they ask you what the option or if you want to say the options are fresh frozen plasma or octoplex and I wouldn't say anything more I'll stop there perfect thank you very much uh, regarding the the mode of uh, mode of action of these drugs is extremely important uh, like heparin and uh, factor two uh, factor two drugs like um, uh, dabigatrin so dabigatrin d for i, I they use i i use the the the, the, the synonymous synonymous of da, die means like two so die dabigatrin for factor two and x for zaral two or what is rivaroxaban Abexiban, anything has X is factor 10, activated factor 10. So that's the, the, that's the, the, the mononymous, or sorry, the monomonic I was using for, for these factors. So to remember the, the mode of action. And I think it's really helpful to remember this in the exam. Yeah, it's helpful, yeah.